Buffalo's new documentary that critics call a paradigm shifting story about the global battle between nature and society. Uh, Ruffalo, who signed on with Public Herald Studios as executive producer of Invisible Hand in 2016, has spent years as a water defender and environmental advocate. More and more, we are waking up to the fact that the world around us is being poisoned, Ruffalo said. The water, air, and land have become toxic dumps, and the law is rigged against us. Covering the rights of nature movement that began in Pennsylvania in 2006 spread around the globe and is now coming back home. Invisible Hand weaves together fights in Pennsylvania and Ohio, the international fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock, North Dakota, and the adoption of rights of nature into Ecuador's national constitution. Cradled in both the Hadnausi prophecy and free market economy. Um, hopefully everybody finished the film. If not, I want to let you know that you, your password is good until midnight um, this evening. So you can go back and finish the film at that point. Um, I want to hope you enjoyed Invisible Hand and that it stimulated lots of questions and ideas for all of you. That's what this next hour is about, discussing our communities and nature's rights to prohibit harms and create the just and sustainable future we all envision. I'm Tish O'Dell, a CELDEF organizer located in Ohio, and I'll be facilitating the Q&A this evening. If any of you tried to watch us the last showing we had, we used YouTube Live and it didn't work so well. So tonight we're trying something new with Zoom and hope that the technology cooperates and it's easier for all of you. So if you could, please type in the chat um, where you're from so people know who is here with us this evening and also lets us know that you can all hear us. We'd also be curious if you wanna type in just some reactions that you had to the film. Um, we'll be sure to pass those along to um, Mark Ruffalo and the directors of the film, Josh Perbanek and Melissa Troutman. Also in chat is how you will be able to interact with the panelists this evening by asking questions. Um, I also want to acknowledge that Marky Miller and Crystal Jankowski are assisting us with technology this evening. And we're very fortunate to have four panelists participating in our Q&A. We have Sherry Straub from Clean Water Now in Florida, Ben Price, a longtime CELDEF organizer and author in Pennsylvania, Michelle Sanborn, who is our CELDEF organizer in the New England area, and Kai Hushka, the CELDEF organizer in the Northwest part of the United States and Hawaii. So I'm gonna just, instead of giving bios about them, let them introduce themselves so you can meet them all and hear them all. So Michelle, you wanna go first? Uh, sure, thank you, Tish. Uh, so I live and work in the Abenaki region of the Missisquoi tribe, uh, otherwise known as Alexandria, New Hampshire. Um, I've assisted communities in New England to adopt sustainable energy ordinances, water rights, uh, anti-discrimination, local laws uh, at a local democratic level. And what this essentially does is elevate the rights of people and ecosystems above those of corporate rights to harm them. Uh, also have worked on a state constitutional amendment to secure those rights at the state level. Thanks, Michelle. Um, ben, you wanna go next? Sure, thanks, Tish, and hello, everybody. Um, ben Price in uh, Carbon County, Pennsylvania. It's uh, the old um, anthracite coal region that uh, was um, uh, really stripped of uh, its energy producing coal uh, to fire up the industrial revolution in the United States. There's a lot of um, history here, some of it not so great. Um, Blue Mountain, uh, I can see out my window, it is returning to green. It had been just a moonscape as a result of some of the industrial activity. This is the original land of the Lenai Lenape people. And um, it's a beautiful part of the world, um, and I'm happy to be here. The uh, work we're doing 
uh, on rights of nature throughout the, the nation is very exciting. And I hope you're following it. And I hope you get involved. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Kai, you want to go next? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. Uh, I'm Kai Hushka. I work as an organizer for the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, I live here in Spokane, Washington. Uh, my work has me uh, collaborating with activists and community members in Washington State and Oregon uh, over the years, also with people in Hawaii, as Tish had mentioned. Um, just excited to be part of the conversation tonight. Uh, I guess to kind of feed off of Michelle and Ben. Um, I live along what's called the uh, Hangman Creek, which is near the confluence with the Spokane River. Uh, it's part of the, the broader, larger watershed that feeds into the Columbia. Uh, it's traditional home of the Spokane tribe. Um, not too far downstream from where I'm at, used to be a, a highly prolific uh, um, salmon spawning zone. Um, tribes from all over this region used to show up here to, to fish. It was the main uh, source of sustenance. Uh, so much like the Central Plains tribes with the buffalo, uh, salmon is um, salmon is everything to the people here. And uh, unfortunately, with the creation of dams and uh, the pollution that's followed since, uh, we don't have uh, the salmon running anymore. So um, I guess secretly, maybe not so secretly, uh, my dream is to see that happen again. Uh, and I haven't given up hope that that's possible. So thanks again, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Kai. And last but definitely not least, we have Sherry Straub from Florida. Unmute, Sherry. You're on mute. There we go. Sorry about that technology. <clears throat> it's coming a long way. Um, I just wanted to Thank everybody um, for joining us tonight. Um, Clean Water Now is extremely excited about hosting this. Um, my name is Sherry Straub and I am the president of Clean Water Now. We are a Florida nonprofit organization. Um, I started working or started getting interested in the rights of nature when the Toledo ones were safe water were working on the Lake Erie Bill of Rights in 2014 after the water crisis. Um, when they went to the ballot and it passed in February, um, I had already been working with various communities in Florida, um, educating them on the rights of nature and what it was about. Uh, luckily that people in Florida had picked that up and they could resonate with the idea of what that what that meant, the rights of nature, um, where, you know, it was giving rights to nature over the corporations. And that's where the fallacy comes that, you know, corporations have more rights than nature does. Um, so we have been organizing in over 20 different counties in Florida because they have the home rule charter. Um, the people of Florida has really spoken up in the last election. And I've been very proud of the people that I've been able to work with, um, with the boots on the ground. Um, but it's people like you that has inspired me um, between Marky Miller, Tish O'Dell, Kai, Michelle, Ben, um, Will, um, the network of people that I met through Seldif, I knew that it was an organization that I wanted to participate with because they were looking out for community rights and the rights of nature. Um, so bringing this to the people of Florida, I knew it was a concept that was needed because there were so many rights that were being violated in Florida and I was happy to bring that to them. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I want to welcome, we have some people from um, Southern Illinois, Catherine, it looks like, some people from Toledo. We also have Kai Sanborn from Lopez Island and Gail Woon, who is from the Bahamas. So welcome. Um, another one from Lopez Island, Elizabeth um, Robson. 
Let's start off with a question here. I'm just gonna throw this out and see who wants to answer. So, and feel free again, put your questions in chat. Um, with the, This is one that somebody submitted ahead of time. So with the latest election, we've heard comments about reinstating power and funding to the EPA, getting the United States back into the Paris Climate Agreement from one side, and then issuing new drilling permits off the coast of Alaska and in public parks from the other side. Can any of you comment on these or where rights of nature fits into the conversation on protecting the environment? Uh, I'll just uh, start off <clears throat> by uh, mentioning that, yes, of course, over the past four years, the uh, federal EPA um, has been um, in essentially dismantled in place. Um, but let's go back to the origins of it. It's been around since 1970. Uh, Richard Nixon um, was uh, president at the time, not a guy who was known for being environmentally friendly. And quite frankly, the EPA, if it was protecting the environment since 1970, um, we might expect that the outcome would be quite different than what we see. It, it's a regulatory agency that regulates the rate of destruction of the natural environment as opposed to actually protecting it. And um, the, the regulatory model, as um, many people know, we, we talk about in our schools, um, it, it's the wrong model for uh, environmental protection. Rights of nature um, means that it's, it would be illegal, it would be a crime to do harm um, to the environment. Um, as things stand, uh, government, state, federal, and local issue permits, in other words, license the harm. Uh, they may put a cap on how much can be done, but the accumulative effect, as we see, um, has been devastating. Uh, so I think that the election is almost a moot point. We have to change pretty much everything uh, about the relationship between people, our industrial society, and the natural world. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there to kind of feed off of Ben just quickly. Uh, I think if one thing that the movie I thought did very well was uh, to explain to those who were watching it and have watched it here tonight and elsewhere that we need a, a radical change of our orientation to the natural world. Um, when I say we, those who've, who've lost touch to that, um, that truth. Uh, and the unfortunate reality is the, the legal view of nature as it stands under those environmental regulatory laws that Ben spoke of and that are basically replicated at the state level, uh, don't see nature as a, a living creature or, or as a sentient being or you know, all the things again that were, were talked about in, in the movie, uh, it, it sees it as a thing, it sees it as a piece of property. Um, and despite the, you know, obviously increased harms that have come over the last four years, the truth is uh, there's been harms happening all along, uh, whether it's been the Republicans at the helm or the Democrats, uh, there's really been not a whole lot of difference. Um, so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's about asking us, can we dig deeper uh, and, and see what we're really a part of in a very different way. And if we can, like people in Toledo, uh, like people in uh, Grant Township, like people in Ecuador, uh, like people elsewhere that didn't get a chance to be part of uh, being sort of featured in the film, um, then I think there is a, a new dawn really that, that can, we can be a part of. Um, but that means thinking differently and acting diff differently and, and ultimately organizing differently. Uh, so if, if our only goal based on that question is to somehow reinstate uh, where we were prior to Trump, for instance, what have we really gained um, and where are we really headed if that's, if that's the, the scheme that we wanna live under uh, versus don't we have to really address it from a, from a longer range perspective, not only from the past, but where we end up in the future um, there's just too much evidence to say it's, it's, it's a failed system. It's, it's built really on, on a toxic basis and uh, we have to do better. Uh, and I think that was also a great thing about the film, these different people speaking to the fact that 
we have to do better and we can do better. And so let's embark on that, no matter how hard that road might be, uh, you know, ahead. Yeah, um, piggybacking off of that as well, uh, thinking along the lines of uh, the, the people and communities have recognized that the system is not broken, it's actually fixed, it's designed, and we heard that in the film, designed to function the way that it does, uh, designed to deny us and keep us from meeting the needs within our communities, which includes we are part of the, the ecosystems. Um, we're not separate from that. So to Kai's point of recognizing that we are intertwined with that. Uh, so a shift in, in our perspective and our way of thinking um, around our connection to the, the natural environment. Um, that there isn't a political party or an elected candidate that is going to save us. It really boils down to us in our communities, recognizing that we are the experts in our communities. We understand our ecosystems. We understand what drives our communities and we understand the needs to, uh, what is necessary to protect our communities. So um, the encouragement with these communities that have done the work on the ground, recognizing that they do have that authority, they are the experts uh, and um, yeah, to, to do it, do it afraid um, and just, just do it. Not let um, external you know, pressures and uh, intimidation stop us from doing what is necessary to ensure a livable future. Thanks, Sherry. Did you want to add anything on this conversation or? You're on mute again, so you have to unmute. I think the biggest part when you're, you're organizing, um, you know, and just with the, the regulations and the laws and stuff like that, you know, the way that Florida was preempted, people th thought, or they still do think, you know, because it's preempted, you know, oh, well, we're just going to quit. You know, that's when we need to dig in even harder and, and fight for it even more because, I mean, I, I, was, I was flabbergasted that they would put four preemptions on four different bills in Florida before it even hit a ballot. I mean, that's how much they, they're scared of the rights of nature. And they don't want to see it happen because they know that it will protect things and they won't have a choice. They'll have to quit polluting our waterways. So, I mean, rights of nature is, it was the only concept that I could grasp that was the right way to go because, I mean, it, who stands up for nature? We have to. Yeah, I think you hit on something. Really, you know, it was a um, power shift, you know, rights of nature is that's why they're so afraid of it. If you have all the power and it's working in your benefit, you don't want anyone to rock that boat and change it. So, of course, that's why they pass the preemption laws. Um, I don't know if, you know, people have anything they want to add, you know, if they've been involved in the regulatory process, people that um, watch the film and maybe are um, on the Q&A. Um, feel free to, you know, type that into chat if you've had experiences in the regulatory system and if what you've run into. Um, one of the other things, the film talks about capitalism quite a bit, and I'm going to throw out there, how do you think capitalism figures into the discussion about protecting nature? Um, the role economics, right, always plays in our fight to protect the environment. I'll take a stab at, at trying to, I guess, give my sense of that question. Um, in our work, in the community rights work, um, that usually gets articulated against looking through how systems function. Uh, and most specifically, when we talk about, you know, how much the system is invested in and willing to protect commercial interests. Uh, and really the property associated with that, uh, which I think is very much um, about what a capitalist system uh, seeks to do, uh, which is, um, you know, largely about producing more. Uh, we often say it's about the endless production of more. Uh, and I think that is a, a key component of what's driven capitalism. 
and and within that really this this ignorance or indifference towards the impacts uh, that it leaves in its wake, uh, whether it's individual people economically or public health wise, whether it's the environment as the rights of nature work um, kind of focuses on more, even though that that world, of course, echoes out and ripples out to everything else. Um, so I, I think very much what we are doing is is really questioning the, the capitalistic model um, and really its intentions and really trying to point out its its impacts, its consequences. And really, ultimately, that in the end, really nobody benefits. We often say it's the minority few, you know, the wealthy elite. Uh, when this country was founded, it was, you know, white men with property uh, of a certain elite status. Um, but in the end, if you have no livable planet, <laughs> who really wins? Uh, so I think this, the, the work, and I, and I believe personally that rights of nature is, is the most threatening to the capitalistic system because it, it basically says we have to live within the bounds of what nature can, can handle and provide and uh, we can't collapse the very systems that keep us alive. Uh, and I think within that you, you begin to actually have to do things differently uh, and in my view much better than the capitalistic model has, has supposedly provided. Um, so yeah, I think, I think our work is intricately linked in that. Um, and I think uh, our work has been about looking at really changing the structure and making sure those who are pulling the levers of how the system works are, are doing it from the standpoint of really protecting the welfare of people in nature uh, and not looking to profit off of people in nature uh, that the capitalistic model has, has needed. It's the fuel for it. And I guess what we're trying to do is cut that fuel off from feeding that system and actually change the whole mechanism, you know, machine itself to be something else. And so, yeah, uh, I think it's very much at looking at, we can do it differently and ultimately we have to do it differently. Yeah, someone just typed into chat, um, said some people we talked to believe that capitalism is part of the solution in terms of motivating the free market solutions to whatever problems we have. One of you wants to comment on that. Yeah, and capitalism as it's, um, I was almost going to say evolved, I think devolved, um, brought us to a, a, a point where we're doing more harm than good to the world. Uh, it means putting a, a dollar sign on everything, monetizing, um, privatizing everything. Um, nature can't survive uh, when every inch of it, every aspect of it is turned legally into property. Um, people can't survive um, and live um, in, a, in a healthy way when they are enslaved and their rights are taken away and they're declared to be property. Um, we know that. Um, it, it works the same way for the natural world. It can't be shackled and used only for the convenience and uh, enjoyment of human beings and, and at that um, only a minority of human beings. Um, we're not going to fight our way out of the mess uh, that uh, this privatization of the world has put us in by doing more of the same. Uh, it's it, digging the hole deeper and deeper is not going to get us out of the ditch. Um, it, you know, it's a it's a simple fact of and, and a simple logic. So um, we get into a lot of detail on that point. The the monetization. Um, of everything, um, the idea of carbon trading, that we're going to turn pollution into an actual commodity that can be traded and sold and the right to pollute can be turned into something that can be traded and um, you know, <laughs> essentially can be invested in. Um, that's just going um, a wrong-headed way. And I, I don't think that it's, uh, I, I know that it's not sustainable, but it's certainly arguable and uh, we have to be cautious of the propaganda around it. I think many people also too like recognize that capitalism is a big part of what creates a lot of the problems that we experience in our communities. Uh, so it's really counterintuitive to think that capitalism is therefore going to be the solution to those problems that are actually caused by it. 
someone just typed in, I wonder if panelists could speak to capitalism and the individual. When I hear this, I hear that individuals are without choice and it often feels like a scapegoat from individual action. Therefore, how to, do we move away from speaking to the choir? I think it's a tough thing to uh, talk with people who are very comfortable um, to say that it's their conveniences and comforts that are causing the problem. Most folks don't want to hear that. Um, the fact that we have to change um, a whole worldview, a paradigm shift to see the world differently and to have a different relationship with the world. Um, frankly, I, I think it's probably not doable in a generation um, the people living in this generation um, are habituated and conditioned to see things the way they see it. I think it's going to take some time, but the longer we wait to get moving down that path, the less time there is to actually accomplish it. Um, and so um, the education has to start um, now. It has started, but it needs to um, increase. Um, young people need to become very aware of the causes of problems we're seeing um, with massive extinctions of life on earth, um, climate change, um, you know, people are going to be hurting, um, food is going to be scarce. Um, if uh, we continue down this path, there's going to be a lot more than just uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that does harm to um, the human population, um, as we see the rest of life on earth is suffering as well. It's tough. Um, the personal um, investment in the way things stand right now makes it difficult for us to change. Um, it's time to start thinking about things differently as indigenous people do with their relationship to the natural world. Um, it's, we, we need to begin uh, to explore where we came from instead of constantly aiming for where in some um, fantasy science fiction version of the future, uh, technology is gonna save us. It's just not. Thanks, but yeah, it's kind of, somebody wrote in and said, can human rights and rights of nature coexist? And I think that's kind of, I mean, it did, we did for thousands of years. It's only been in the last couple of hundred that we've been, you know, run into these problems. And so, and it's interesting that that seems to coincide with when, you know, corporate rights and property rights and all those kind of things came into play. But before that, human rights and rights of nature did coexist. Um, I think um, we could go on talking about capitalism probably, you know, for a long time, probably the whole hour. Um, but there's some other questions coming up and shifting it a little bit to the courts. There's been several questions about um, the court system, somebody said, I'm interested in attempts and failures to establish and validate rights of nature judicially through the courts. What strategies have you seen fail and what strategies look promising? And then someone else also asked, um, they're not sure they understand how the farm in Wood County was, giving, was given standing in the first place to go after the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. And that was in the film. Um, I can you know, say, I don't know how they were given standing either. <laughs> it just, they weren't actually harmed. Um, they weren't in the city of Toledo, they're outside. So, you know, it kind of is a good, you know, I don't know. Uh, the judge all of a sudden waved his magic wand and said, yes, they have standing, um, in my opinion. So that's my answer to that one. If someone else, but I think, you know, there are, and then I think I saw another question about that too, about the courts and how do we, um, how, how do we make sure these laws are upheld and enforced for rights of nature? So anyone wanna shift the discussion now to courts? Um, yeah, this is Kai. I, you know, rights of nature is, is uh, as the movie pointed out, it's moved beyond just the United States uh, from, from that legalize, you know, legalizing rights of nature. I mean, again, keeping in mind, I think also as the movie did a good job with that, that notion, and you just mentioned it, Tish, that, that people had this symbiotic relationship to the natural world. They didn't need to write laws down. They didn't need to have courts. Um, it was just understood. Uh, clearly, we're at a different point in our human history here, and, and Western law has 
found its way everywhere. Uh, and so we're having to, to contend with that, both in the standpoint of how it functions today and our desire to transform it. So um, legally speaking, of course, the, the higher up you can move within your governmental structure, uh, Ecuador being one of the examples given, you know, constitutionalizing it in the national constitution, you know, clearly makes making legal arguments in court uh, a lot easier because you have something directly to point to now and in the construct of law, you know, things that are uh, seen as a right within a constitutional construct, you know, are given a certain level of, you know, prominence um, from where you can argue from. And, you know, if you're looking at that structure, you know, that's clearly where you want to end up. So if you were to bring it back to the United States, if we had that constitutionalized at the federal level, you know, you begin to be able to make arguments on behalf of ecosystems and having those, those decisions, let's say, stick. Uh, because you have that, that backing of how our system operates. Unfortunately, where we sit today, we, we haven't arrived there, um, which is why it's so important for things to happen at the local level. Uh, really this push to put out the notion of rights of nature through law has I think been a very effective means to one, I think challenge the notion of law and how it operates. But I think back to the question previously, you know, how do you not speak to the choir? Well. When you start making legal arguments in the courts and they start getting covered, you start having more and more and more people sort of look at that and scratch their head and perhaps challenge it or dismiss it or embrace it. Uh, and that's the kind of momentum that helps build, you know, systemic change. And we've seen that through people's movements in the past and how they've uh, been able to find themselves in the courts and make the arguments for, for equity and justice. Uh, and I see that the same being the case for rights of nature. And so um, we're at a point now where enforceability is, is not an easy thing uh, because of how swift the courts have come in, how swift, as Sherry mentioned, you know, the state legislature will pass state preemptive laws. Uh, the system is very good at seeing things as uh, a virus, um, to use the language of the day, I guess. Uh, and they want to kill it off. Um, and uh, the good thing is people have said, no, we're gonna keep moving forward despite whatever court rulings may come out. Um, and I think that's a good thing that that level of defiance and disobedience to the unjust system, um, that's what we have to do. And I think the courts have a role to play still despite um, what seem like losses. Uh, I think that's still a venue and an arena that we should be operating in uh, and right now the access points seem to be locally speaking, there's some momentum at the state level. Uh, and eventually if we want to subscribe to the structure of government as we have it, um, that all becomes, I think, energy, momentum and force uh, to eventually be uh, making our way into that federal level. Uh, I, I'll just uh, say a couple of things about the courts. Um, it's very typical uh, for Americans to say, well, what did the judges say? What did the, the courts say? Um, the courts and the judges um, aren't actually the, the sovereigns, uh, at least in theory, in the United States. Um, but the fact is that, uh, for instance, when um, Druis Farms um, sues Toledo to overturn the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, what gives the corporation standing? The Supreme Court gave it standing when it said that corporations are persons and that as persons they have Bill of Rights protections. And the, the, the corporation um, through its lawyers was able to argue um, that the corporate uh, person would have its rights harmed. There would be a, a violation of its civil rights for over 60% of Toledoans to pass a law that says um, that if the corporation is found to be polluting the lake, that it will be liable for a violation of the law. Um, and, uh, and based on precedent, in other words, based on what the courts had done in the past and what had been written in law, um, the courts had no other choice um, in their argument, uh, way of arguing it, than to overturn the law and say, we're going to vindicate the rights of the corporate person over um, the brashness of the people of Toledo. Um, that's where we stand. It's that out of kilter that the people who supposedly govern this country um, and who attempt to make law to protect their rights and the rights of nature uh, are overruled 
by a court system that says what the Federalists said in 1787 um, is more important than what the people living today think is needed. Uh, that's where we are. That's why we need to make systemic change in the law, in the Constitution, in the way we govern ourselves. We don't govern ourselves. We've got a lot of dead Federalists who govern us and a lot of living judges who make sure that continues to be the case. It seems like recently too, like I'm hearing more and more about corporations uh, ignoring court rulings, right? So there, there may be a ruling that tells them that, that they have to stop a certain activity and, and they just ignore it. Um, and what that does is it delegitimizes. And yet we don't do that. You know, we, we don't stop to think about how that um, playbook, if you will, um, can be used, you know, even at the local level to, to delegitimize unjust rulings. So when we're talking about court rulings and the, the concept of the power that they hold, um, you know, power doesn't concede without a demand. And oftentimes our compliance with what is um, considered law, which is just words on paper, uh, or a court ruling, which is the, essentially the, the same thing, um, we, by, by obeying these unjust and harmful uh, rulings and or laws, um, we are actually legitimizing them. And so a lot of what the communities are doing with these local laws and in other uh, countries with constitutional and tribal um, uh, changes and recognizing rights of nature is withdrawing the consent to be governed in such a way. And that's delegitimizing that current structure. Yeah, I really agree with that. I mean, we saw that in Toledo. Um, here the people voted, you know, 67% of the population, they had been without water, had a crisis there, and they went ahead and passed this law. This is what they needed to protect themselves. They knew the regulatory system wasn't helping, and it comes down to a single judge in a courtroom, and he chooses to recognize the rights of the corporate farm over the rights of all the people to democratically protect themselves from harm. So, yeah. We put too much, um, I guess, credence and hope in the courts because they're there to enforce the laws and precedent as it as it stands at the moment, and so that's protecting, you know, the property and the interests of the one percent currently. Um, I'm looking to see some other um, questions here. Let's see. I think we kind of already touched on the presidential leadership if that change um, will help. So in other words, I guess back to the courts, I'm kind of thinking, so in other words, we kind of have to delegitimize the courts is what I heard all of you kind of say. Well, I think the, the, the movie points that out. I mean, the movie points out that um, that sort of the corporate state in full effect. And, you know, it's the corporation, of course, that gets our attention and rightfully so. Um, but then, of course, through the, the progress of our work, the, the idea is to sort of peel back what else is at play here, because it's not purely the, the corporate form, it's the corporate form in concert with the state often I would say um, hijacking government for its interests. Uh, and then tied to that, of course, it's the courts um, because they need the courts backing. Uh, so if, when people question their actions, um, uh, you know, from a legal or constitutional standpoint, um, you know, they have the courts and those court decisions that Ben mentioned, you know, backing up their actions is, is justifiable. You know, it's all rationalized. It's all normalized. It's all part of how it's supposed to work. And, um, and here we go. And so, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to, to think about. There's a, a great article by Kianga Taylor. Uh, she uh, teaches at Princeton University talking about the Supreme Court and whether or not we should really rethink that institution um, as a person of color in this country, um, you know, talking about what the courts really meant to, to that population here and how it's not been its friend uh, and in some ways, 
probably really isn't been set up to be our friends when we start talking about basic human rights. So uh, the time's overdue, in my opinion, that we, you know, and in, in some ways it's sort of like as a, as you know, parents are told to, to teach their children, which is to question authority, you know, how much of that's still within us. Um, hopefully a lot of that, because uh, not only is there a lot of questioning needing to be done, but there's a lot of action needing to be done to, to remove those so-called people of authority and, and really institute ourselves as, as the ones that need to, to drive forward. And institutions like the courts are by no means, um, you know, outside the realm of, of, of those needing our, not only our ire, but our, our efforts and our organizing to deal with. So absolutely. Yeah, Ben, wasn't you're the, you're our history um, expert here, wasn't there in the past? Wasn't that one of the things that the um, revolutionary, you know, when the revolution was going on, and didn't they go and like take over the courts? Wasn't that one of the things they did? Yeah, well, in Western Massachusetts, it was um, prior to um, the actual what you know, kind of the uh, the date of the start of the American Revolution. Even prior to that, folks in Western Massachusetts uh, were um, heading to the courts and re removing the magistrates. Um, they would escort them out of town and send them back to Boston and say, don't come back again. Of course, these were uh, magistrates who were representing uh, the power of the empire. And um, very frequently for um, lack of, of payment to taxes and so forth, uh, farms were being lost. They were being confiscated. Uh, property was being confiscated. People were being left without anything. Um, and uh, they rebelled. They said, we have no representation. Um, this system of so-called justice doesn't serve justice to us. Um, it, it, all it does is justify the power of the empire in our midst. And so um, that was actually one of the first actions taken by the colonists in in uh, North America um, to simply say that, look, we're not going to tolerate um, this government that doesn't actually function in our midst. It, does, it doesn't represent us. Um, it's across the ocean. Um, and here it is imposing its will on our community. And that's just not gonna be tolerated. Yeah, someone said so. There's lessons to be learned for today. Exactly. Um, Virginia typed in, she said, so keeping local autonomy is primary. And Nancy typed in and said, comes down to money and those who are servants of it instead of the true well being of others. Yeah, it's really a just us system, it's not a justice system. Uh, and the just us system uh, protects the, the status quo um, of those that, that put that structure of power in place and those that benefit from that structure of power. Um, and so, yeah, it, that structure, if we look to it to save us, uh, it's a sinking ship. Um, and we're the only ones that are going to really be holding the values of, of what are what is needed within our natural communities, which we are a part of, um, to ensure a livable future and putting that in the hands of that just us system, the, the good old boys club or whatever you want to call it. Um, it it's, a, it's an elite few. Um, and yeah, I, I often hear like through this process of running a state constitutional amendment have heard, well, you know, the courts are there to protect us. And, and how do you respond to, you know, when they have a ruling that is actually, you know, in your favor. And um, my response to that is like, well, that's like crumbs being brushed off the table. You know, once in a blue moon, you get a quote, a win, um, but that win is not defined on uh, what the community desired, what the community was attempting to protect. It's defined on a system that was designed to protect something that, that you didn't have a say in. Um, and it's really also uh, occasional wins have, have the effect of legitimizing that status quo, right? Um, kind of convincing us that it does work and somehow it does protect us. Uh, but if you look at the bigger picture of it, um, it's, not, it's not the case. Uh, it really protects the, the status quo of the corporate state and not what we actually need within our communities.
Kai, you wanted to go ahead and say something? Yeah, I, I just need to apologize. I unfortunately have to leave before our discussion's over here. I, I feel bad about that. Um, thoroughly enjoy uh, this gathering and, and really wish we could all be in a room together. It'd be so much better. <laughs> Uh, but I'm heading off actually to another aspect of our work, which is to facilitate a, uh, an event talking about state ceiling preemption, which is very much at play when it comes to rights of nature. Uh, we've seen it play out in, in different states. Uh, and so I'm off to, to be part of that conversation here. And, uh, but thank you very much for, for having me tonight. And um, yeah, have a good evening. Thanks, Kai. Um, Crystal, Crystal put in the chat. She put in the link there. So it's called State Preemption is Crushing Local Democracy. So if people want to go get off this one when we're done and we'll be ending at nine and hop over to that one, you can. Um, it, you know, Tish, there was a question that um, about um, focusing on local um, organizing and, and local lawmaking and so forth. It's something that we've done with CELDEF over the years. And it's not just it's not just because it's the only government that seems to be accessible, and very many of them even aren't very accessible. Uh, and especially the fact that we have uh, legal uh, dogmas like uh, Dylan's rule that says the state can dictate pretty much everything to the localities and so forth. Uh, but in terms of the the film and and the idea of rights of nature. Um, you know, Grand Township, it's a small community, and that's where people took a stand. They said, not here. Um, the, the aquifer here, the groundwater here isn't going to be poisoned by um, the frack waste that you want to pump into the ground. You shouldn't be taking it, taking um, the gas out of the ground to begin with. Um, it, you want to call it natural gas? It's great. It's natural when it's down there in those rock seams. It's not natural when it's up here in our lungs um, in, in the lungs of the planet. Um, but local organizing is, um, it, I think that it just makes some organic sense uh, that first off, the idea of nations and states, um, it's a human construct. They only exist on paper and in our heads. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to say that from space, you can't see the borders between the nations and you can't see the property lines uh, where the no trespassing signs are posted. They're not real except for in our heads and on paper and in the recorder of deeds office. Um, but communities of people are real. They can be located. And the things that are being harmed are in those communities. Every harm to the environment that happens on the planet Earth happens, starts somewhere. There's a source, there's a place that it's imposed on the world. And the people who live in that place, uh, we would argue, uh, need to be the ones who decide um, what's going to be permitted, what's going to be allowed. It shouldn't be, the permits shouldn't be issued um, by someone in a town, in a city, in the capital of the state, um, miles away from the community. The people who live in the community are part of the ecosystem, is what I would argue. That we're not separate and apart. That's part of Western culture and civilization to believe that human beings are apart from and superior to the natural world. Um, but as we know, we depend on it for our lives. And there's no better place uh, to take a stand and protect the natural world than where people live. And to, um, as we do in the rights of nature laws that we've been um, writing for communities, and to, um, in a sense, not deputize, but designate the members of the community as the human representatives in human courts of the natural world and its rights. It just makes sense. Who else would be the stewards but the people who actually live within that environment? Um, another question came in. It said the two main stories in the film are both fighting against something concrete, immediate, nearby. Um, how do we best motivate people without the immediate harm threatening? Climate change seems to be too fuzzy for people to latch onto as an immediate harm. A potential oil spill is just a potential. Of course, if it happens, it's too late. Um, we try to make the moral and ethical case, but it hasn't yet been enough. Is 
it's a great question. Michelle, did you want to start off? I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, yeah, so it, it is an ongoing um, uh, question. Uh, I think partly there's there's an element of maybe human nature that uh, you're not motivated to take action unless the lion is on your side of the herd, you know, if there isn't a direct threat. Um, it seems to just be our nature uh, to uh, to you know, feel like everything's okay and it's comfortable, right? Um, and it's typically not until we're we're confronted with something that um, kind of pushes us out of our comfort zone, where we feel threatened, uh, that we tend to be be motivated to take action. And I think that that's a complex uh, concept, to be honest. Like it's it's a lot of how this whole system is designed. There's so much within the, the structure of, of lawmaking, whether it's at the local, the state or the federal level, that makes it so difficult to understand how to navigate it, how to, how to engage in it. It's very much a pay to play system. So most people automatically in their own minds are convinced that, that there's no place for them. Uh, and so we, we shut ourselves down. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, that that's not going to, that's not helpful. It's, um, we definitely need to take proactive uh, action. And uh, why wait until the harm has already occurred? There are communities uh, in New England that have taken proactive action and have adopted local democratic laws that protect their water and protect their energy uh, and anti-discrimination rights-based ordinance at the local level. Many of these things were, were done proactively. Uh, the, the narrative around that is finding the common denominator uh, what is it that is uh, important to people? Water is pretty much at the top of that list for most people anywhere on the face of the planet. Uh, air quality and and really boiling down to who actually gets to decide what what that is like, what that looks like. What does your community look like? What does healthy, clean water look like? Um, and what do you feel is threatening that? And I think every community is facing something that is threatening them on some level, whether it's free and fair elections or you know, threat to that system, uh, energy, water, waste, uh, everything. So finding the common denominator, um, you know, de developing your, your talking points, if you will, um, around that and recognizing that rights-based organizing and recognizing rights of nature um, can be connected. It cannot be separated from any of these, what we might call topics or, or issues. They're all interconnected. Um, most that resonates with, with most people, but it, it still kind of comes back to uh, recognizing that um, a lot of people are not motivated unless there's a direct threat. So it's an ongoing question. And I think if we had the, the ultimate answer to it, uh, all communities would be doing this work um, and we, we wouldn't be uh, necessarily uh, doing these webinars and, and other outreach because people would just know and it would be a part of their, their way of thinking and their way of, of being active and engaged um, within their their community. Yeah, I think that's a great answer, Michelle. It's again, and again, we believe until something bad happens, we feel like we're being protected because that's what we're taught. You know, we think that there's some protection agency or government agency or something, you know, that, that's taking care of everything until that threat actually comes to our backyards. Um, I think we have time for one more question um, and then we're going to have to probably say good night, but um, someone asked and said, could you speak about the recent rights of nature law that was passed in Orange County, Florida, and how that fits or does not fit into this picture? I'll just say that, um, first off, it's good that people come together and they work um, to put uh, on the ballot uh, measures that are going to make things better, that are gonna protect uh, their water, and that was the, the focus of it. Um, and that's great, and it took a lot of work, and that's to be um, congratulated. Um, the, the issues that, um, when I look at a bill like this, the concerns I have is the use of the term rights of nature uh, when within the law, and it, and it gets kind of a little bit complicated, but the way that the law is constructed um, the language actually subordinates the rights that, um, okay, we want to recognize rights for nature, and in the next breath essentially says, 
and those rights will be protected by the existing um, definitions of pollution in Florida law. Um, and so um, what we're saying, what, what concerns me about it is that rather than moving, um, moving the bar and saying we're, we're going to aim higher, it says we're going to say that we recognize that, you know, that the waters have rights, um, but those rights are going to be only protected by the existing frame of law. Um, well, it's not quite the, as effective uh, when uh, you haven't actually challenged the fact that the laws that exist right now are not protective. Um, they're not protective of human communities. They're not protective of natural communities. Uh, and so it's perhaps um, safer to go that way. The, ch the chances are that uh, there won't be much um, of a brouhaha. The in industrial folks who are doing the pollution um, aren't going to see the need to, um, to challenge this measure so much because in effect, it doesn't stop them from doing exactly what they're already doing. Um, enforcement is an important aspect. Uh, if we're going to advance the rights of nature, it means, um, and I know that it's tough, you know, don't get me wrong, and I, I don't mean to diminish the fact that these folks came together and they're doing what they can uh, to protect their water, um, but we need to not lose sight of what we mean by rights of nature. It's not about what's convenient for people, and it's not about the relationship between people and the water. It's about the water's relationship um, to the laws of men and women, and men and women need to change the laws so that they don't continually make it legal to do harm to the environment. That's, that's the goal. Um, and it, we have to be careful that we're not claiming to have done that when we haven't actually done it. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think this has been a really great discussion. I want to thank all of you who watched the film and all the panelists this evening. I also want to thank Mark Ruffalo and Public Herald for their support and for making this important documentary in the first place. Um, just so you know, we're going to be posting this Q&A on the CELDEF YouTube channel so you can share it with others or if you came in late. Um, and if you're in Florida, I'm going to share here up on the screen. Um, there you go. So you can um, see these are contact if you want to contact Clean Water Now if you are in Florida or if you're in another state, please contact CELDEF. Um, these links are in the chat. And here's Sherry. At, do you want to add anything here at the end before we close out? Sorry, I didn't mute. Um, on the uh, Clean Water Now Facebook page, um, my phone number is also listed there. So if you want to feel old school and pick up the phone and call me, <laughs> I'm all for that too. Um, the, the more people that we can get in the various counties in the 20 different counties that are available, um, don't forget there's 416 different cities too. So we need to get moving Florida. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks for everybody who participated this evening. Hope we see you again. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>